afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Kathy Hawks, Associate Dean for External Relations and Global Programs here at MIT Sloan. We are excited to be partnering with our friends at the School of Engineering on this event today. And thank you for joining our iLead Spring Series. The iLead series is so close to the school's mission, bringing principled, innovative leaders to MIT to spend time with us. So thank you so much for being here. Three things to know before I turn things over to Anantha. Uh, we will have live Q&A at the end of the fireside chat, so be uh, filing those questions away. We'll be passing microphones around. Welcome to our friends on Zoom. For all of you, you may enter the uh, questions into the Q&A box as we go along, and someone in the auditorium will announce it for you. And finally, the session is being recorded and will be shared in the coming weeks. So with that, it is my pleasure to turn things over to the Dean of the MIT School of Engineering, the Van Eyre Bush Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, Science Anantha Chandrakasan. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Kathy. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us here today. Um, I'm thrilled to co-host this event with Dean Schmidtlein and to be able to gather our Sloan and School of Engineering students in person, uh, as well as to welcome our alumni participants virtually. I'm always excited uh, when we can bring our schools together. I'm really delighted and deeply honored to introduce our guest speaker, Ginny Rometty, former chairman, president, and CEO of IBM. Ginny is a renowned business leader and innovator. She first joined IBM as a systems engineer in 1981 before eventually becoming its ninth chairman, president, and chief executive officer in 2012. Under her leadership, the 100-year-old company reinvented 50% of its portfolio, built a 25 billion hybrid cloud business, and established leadership in AI and quantum computing. In 2017, during her tenure as chairman, president, and CEO, MIT and IBM collaborated to create the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab, which continues to drive innovations in AI algorithms and systems. She also drove record results in diversity and inclusion and supported the explosive growth of an innovative high school program to prepare the workforce of the future in over 28 countries. Through her work with the Business Roundtable, she helped redefine the purpose of the corporation. She was named Fortune's number one most powerful woman for three years in a row, is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, and has been honored with the designation of officier in the French Légion d'Honneur. Today, she serves on multiple boards and co-chairs 110, a coalition committed to upskilling, hiring, and promoting one million black Americans without four-year degrees by 2030 into family-sustaining jobs and careers. Ginny has a long-standing relationship with MIT. She, she served as a member of the MIT Presidential CEO Advisory Board, as well as the Advisory Board of the MIT Task Force on the Work of the Future. Last year, Ginny served as the fifth MIT Visiting Innovation Fellow. As a fellow, she focused on advancing women in STEM and entrepreneurship, as well as bolstering ethics and responsibility in a digital age. She's also the author of the recently released Good Power, Leading Positive Change in Our Lives, Work, and the World, a moving combination of memoir, and uh, uh, memoir, leadership lessons, and big ideas. The book shares milestones from her life and career while redefining power as a way to drive meaningful change in positive ways for ourselves, our organizations, and for the many, not just the few, a concept she calls good power. 
With that, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Ginny and hand the session off to Dean Schmidtlein, who will lead us in conversation. So, welcome. Anatha, that was very long. <laughs> and very comprehensive. And yet incomplete. Oh, no, no. <laughs> uh, so, so let's try to fill in some more of the blanks. How okay, about that? Okay, good. Uh, nice to see you, David. Nice to see you. Thank you. Welcome back to MIT, Thanks. always. Um, so um, uh, I think it would be great if we could focus in three areas. Uh, one is um, career and some of your early experiences. The time at IBM we need to talk about, and I'll ha have a couple questions for you. Okay. Um, and then um, your experiences as a, leader, as a leader and life lessons and advice. Um, we'll turn to that, of course. Okay. So if we could start maybe closer to the beginning, um, your early years or early career, are there some aspirations that you had for yourself or ways that you thought about yourself in an organization that um, in your mind had something to do with a trajectory that's extraordinary that you've experienced and pursued? Well, can I, can I ask them a question before I answer one? You're the boss. Okay, so just to give me a feel, how many folks are here from the engineering school? Okay, and then Sloan. Okay, okay, I just wanted to know who my audience is. <laughs> the poor little engineers we'll meet later. <laughs> just, uh, um, okay, so that helps me a little bit. Um, so we're gonna talk about a lot of things today and hopefully it's gonna be, maybe you'll take away a few things that'll be helpful for each one of you. Uh, it's the only reason to do this. So early on, what were my insights and aspirations? I had none. And so um, I know that sounds probably pretty odd, but in many of you, I have, how many of I asked you, how many of you want to build something and run something? Almost everybody in the room, right? So, you know, it probably stems back to my, my upbringing, which is a, really part of where I start the book, because um, I, I say I was raised by strong women, but who all suffered huge tragedies. And this probably gets to what my only aspiration was at the time. Um, my great grandma had uh, been the last person alive at World War I to leave Belarus uh, to come here. She never did speak English. She cleaned bathrooms in the Wrigley Building in Chicago her whole life. Um, my grandma would be a widow twice by her very early age and would sew lampshades. And then my mother, when uh, she was only 32, my father would abandon our family and leave my mother and four of us with no food, no home, nothing. And so what did I learn out of that? We'll get to what the answer is to that aspiration question, was all I saw at that point in my life was, first, be fiercely independent, because what I saw with my mom when my father left and said he didn't care what happened to us, my mom had never had a day of education outside of uh, high school. She had never had a job, but she was so determined to not let that define who our family would be. She went back and got a little bit of education and then a little better job and a little bit, enough to get us off of financial aid. And that taught me, don't let anyone else define you, only you define who you are. And this will come back into my life many times, that if you don't define who you are, someone else will. And that taught me as well though, hey, hard work pays off. I know maybe men, some people don't believe that anymore, but just hard work. And the third thing was to be fiercely independent, meaning never have to count on anyone else. So my only aspiration then to start my career, yeah. so different than I suspect so many of you now, was just do work really hard, do well, something else will happen, you'd be able to take care of yourself and not have to rely on someone else. So that's where it starts, is honestly nothing more interesting than that. I would say that's pretty interesting. Not really. Uh, I mean, <laughs> what about education? Yeah, so, okay, well, I'm talking to a group here that highly believes in this topic. I mean, so two things uh, I would mention on education that got formed early in my mind. Only when you write a book in your life will you ever reflect back and realize these things. Um, we'll come back to why did I ever write a book. But uh, one was from my mom's experience that taught me that access and aptitude were two different things. Mm -hmm. And that this idea that, like my mom wasn't, you know, uh, I, I would say dumb, that sounds horrible, I don't mean it that. My, my mom was actually smart, she just didn't have access to anything. Yeah. And so I sort of started to realize, and this would come back into my career many times, mm -hmm. that uh, brains are distributed evenly, opportunity is not. 
And so that would impact my view of education strongly. Now, the other thing that would impact it, I was good at math. And so I just, you know, I, I loved it. I didn't ever want to memorize anything. My brother could sleep on a book and know what it said, right? And, and I used to, it was so frustrating, you know, he would, you know, he had a test the next day and about maybe midnight he'd open the book or something. And I'd have been studying for eight hours. And so what I always attributed math and science to, now I know you're not all math and science, but that it was a, it was a, a genre that you could, study and understand how to come to an answer and how to solve a problem, you didn't have to memorize it. And that's what I loved about the math and that, that ability. So that impacted, and to this day, I try to convince more and more people to go into not just business, don't, don't give me, you know, math and sciences, because I, to my view, it teaches you to solve any kind of problem. Because uh, all problems are big nowadays, and they gotta be broken up into little pieces. So I, I was, I strongly, you know, so from the very beginning, I, I went into engineering. And now I was the only woman in engineering at that time, but that is why I went into engineering. So, it, and I don't want to get us off on a tangent. Um, Feel free, but I and it might be more interesting. Yeah, okay. I don't think so. Uh, but the 110 initiative, which yeah. I so love, and which you um, co-founded. Uh, well, is, yeah, it, it's, it's worth a quick a tangent, let's, guys. Because so many of you are gonna run companies and run groups, and if, I, if, you, if, if David said to me, Ginny, what would be like the one thing you want to get across to folks? And it's, it's like a, a silver line through the book, and it is this point about access and aptitude, and, yeah. and like lifelong learning. Because everything in our world is set up for once and done education. And I mean, the government systems, the programs, the reinforcement, the time you go to school then, yet I found I would much rather hire people for a propensity to learn than what they knew. And so 110, which takes me, gonna take me like real fast through a life, I had this, this experience with my mom about access and aptitude. I watched this. Then I'm gonna really fast forward. I would become CEO in a time when, I know you'll find this weird, there was nothing like cyber. And we were beginning a cyber business and had to find people to hire. Unemployment's 10% and I can't find anybody with skills. And serendipity, I, it was truly serendipity. I would walk into a meeting the next day, or next hour it was, on corporate social responsibility, which I don't believe this is, but I'll come back to that. And they're saying, hey, we're gonna work with this four-year high, high school in a very poor neighborhood with a community college, and we're gonna give them a curriculum, help them with internships, maybe give them a few jobs. We think we could teach cyber. And I said, okay. Well, lo and behold, I'm gonna fast forward without giving you the whole story, because I, I would spend 15 years on this. This is a talent strategy. And yes. what I would learn was that all these first generation people had never been to school. Very smart, by the way. Just had no opportunity and access. And this would be true in every developed country in the world. To, if I could hire people for their skills, not just a degree, it get, it'll get to what I do right now with 110, I would learn half the jobs in this country are over-credentialed. They require a college degree when they should not to start. I didn't say you don't eventually maybe need to need one. And in these people that we would hire, we would, I, of course I have a bunch of engineers, um, and we only hired PhDs in university grads. We would redo, it would take five years, all of our credentialing, to, it would end up to be 50% required a college degree to start, not 95. We would go on to work with these kind of schools and set them up in, yes. 30 countries around the world. There's a pipeline of 150,000 kids coming through. New York and Texas are the biggest states. They're up to 100, 150 schools like this now. But it was a bigger concept I started to learn. Skills first. Hire people for skills, not just a degree. And I'll fast forward to 110 and end there. Um, on the heels of George, you say, so what does all this have to do? So to me, it was a jackpot, a brand new pool of talent extremely capable. I measured their results for years. They performed as well as my college grads. They took more education. They all, almost all went back, by the way, and finished college. It just was a matter of where they start should not have determined where they ended. They had an earlier on-ramp than, than you and I would have had. And uh, on the heels then of George Floyd's murder, um, business was looking at what to do to help. And I had just participated in the work of the future. And there are numbers that will always be in my head. 65% of Americans don't have a college degree. 80% of black Americans do not have a college degree. Mm -hmm. So if you wonder what matters to democracy. Our sisters and I each have a different memory. 
oh, that's my book. That's pretty. She's mine. So she, that, that she's somehow maybe listening to my book. Um, I hope it's not the first time, okay? Because she's worked with me for a year. Um, but on the heels of this George Floyd murder, what would happen was business is like, oh, do we give money? What do we do? And we're like, no, we should do what we do best, hire people and get them skill. And economic opportunity is the best answer to systemic racism. That's a long answer that I didn't mean to be so long, which takes me to 110. We ended up forming a group called 110, one million black employees in 10 years, as Anantha said, that said, they had the aspiration, Ken Chenault, Ken Frazier. I don't know if any of you know them. One ran American Express, one ran Merck, two of my very good friends. So they had this great vision, two great, vi and I'm like, okay, but they don't know how to do it. I know how to do it. So I'm like, they're the visionary, I'm the plumber. And it's like, skills first is the answer because of this dilemma, 80%. But if we could get people with the right skills to get started, they can get into these jobs. And so we are 100,000 people in now that we've gotten jobs. Uh, we obviously have 900,000 to go, so hopefully hitting a knee of our curve. Um, but it would be this idea of skills first as a movement in this country and around the world that I say is as important of an aspect if we believe democracy should succeed in this country and around the world. Because if people don't think they have a better future, they pick another system, they riot, they do all sorts of things. Um, and all that has to do with economic opportunity, which I like go back, it's so funny how a line goes through your life, right? I go back to my mother. And um, so that's, I, I, I really don't need you up here, you know, I could talk the whole time, actually. <laughs> It's a bad habit, okay? So um, I feel horrible, because he's like the dean of a great school, right? So go ahead, what is your next question? I should not, because I could lead into another one, but go right ahead. The best sessions are ones that have little me and a lot. No, no, no. Uh, Do you agree with anything I said? I mean, yes, look, I, I am say vice yes. chair at a university, yes. so it's not like I'm so, against university at all. So that it, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. So only because we're in a quiet room where no one will repeat what we said. But we're on a... I love Zoom. both Ken's and Ginny, and what she said about the three is correct. Oh, that <laughs> I'm the plumber and they're the visionaries. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but in terms of the plumbing, the, um, what you did, I would suggest, is create um, a program and a process, but you also, the three of you, helped change the narrative. Yeah. And so, uh, and that's, you know, that's not only going to happen within the four corners of 110. It's really so important. So oh, no, no. I, I hope this is a movement in the country. Yeah. So 110, I should say, well, the other part that, that Dave is referring to. So we got 100 of the biggest companies yeah. to join us in not only donate money to build the system, but go through all their job requisitions now yeah. and re, and, and it, it just starts there. That's the first thing, because if the only thing you do is take the little check off a box, trust me, you'll still hire college degree people. Um, you gotta train your, you know, your recruiters. You gotta change your whole talent system to be a build-oriented system, not buy-oriented system. You gotta pay people for their skills, not their degrees only. You, you know, it ends up to be a whole cultural change, but, yeah. And that's why all these companies are working on it. Some of you may work for, very well may work for many of the companies we're talking about. Um, and I hope, you know, I hope if that's all I do in life, that that's, that will be a life well lived. And it won't be. Uh, well, uh, well, I hope we got to get our work done. Okay. Um, so we only have a minute left. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Sorry about uh, that. So, so let's talk about that whole IBM thing, yep. $25 billion and reinventing 50% of the company and cloud and so on. So just you know, take 30 seconds yeah. and take so us through me, how you did that. Would you? I, I agree. For everybody in here who's starting something or you know, going to be or in the middle of a company that was, look, there is no doubt, IBM is the oldest technology company, right? So you're sitting there thinking, well, wait a second, there's Google, there's Amazon, there's this, there's that. You're right. I mean... And one day everyone else will have their chance to have to reinvent multiple times. Because it's, uh, in retrospect, it's easy to have act one and act two. Act three, four, and five get really hard. And I would take over at a time of IBM um, where, you know, you don't get to pick your times. Mm -hmm. And it would be at a moment where it would be the most tumultuous time of reinvention in tech. And I would say we were not prepared for that. We had been very prepared for the past not the future. And, and it was multiple technology trends. You had, go back to 2012, you have cloud starting, big data, AI, you've got um, mobile, social, 
or, I mean, you, this not your cell phones aren't all that long ago, yes. and uh, all that swirling. And we're an enterprise company, not a consumer company. This will become a very important difference. And uh, so, so be it. We, we each get our moments. And so what I write in the book, there's a whole middle section called the power, there's the power of me about like, what could I practically help people with, like the tough lessons I learned as an individual? At some point though, you manage people, maybe. Yeah. And the middle is the power of we, when you care less about yourself and more about other people. And it, it is revisionist history. I am the first one to tell you this in the book. So it's, it's meaning in retrospect. So you say, how did I do it? It's only in retrospect. You know, what did I learn and the mistakes that I made in that time frame? And um, there's a couple principles that I talk about. But the one I'll mention here to David's question was my biggest learning was to understand what to change, but what should endure. And I don't know about you, you know, often when things have to change, people run to change, change everything. Like I did too. But I made some mistakes in that I also had to go back and refocus on what should endure because that is often the more difficult question to answer, even if it has to be modernized. So it doesn't mean like, what do you hold on to that's old? It's the, what is your soul? And what is it that you can build from? Because if people are gonna have to change a lot, there needs to be something they can hold on to while those winds of change whip. And um, so change, like I've been, we've been very involved with MIT on the semiconductor side. IBM was the father of semiconductors. Um, it was the first one to commercialize it in the country. So here we are though now, decades, decades later, as an example on change, I write a big section on how to manage tension and run to conflict. Because I'm sorry, in the world we live in now, there are no good answers to anything. And it, it's either X, people say X or Y, you know, polarized everything. And I really wanna try to convince you that sometimes you have to sit there to figure out a third way through something. And that idea for semiconductors for us was what we had to do to find this third way. Because I had shareholders who were like, get out of that business, it costs so much money, it's 10, 000, 10 billion a fab. I mean, look at the country's situation now. I had customers like, oh my God, that part of your business, which isn't big, but I rely on it to run every bank, airline in this country, right. you know, you can't get out of it. So I couldn't please anybody. And the net of it is how that story ends on how to manage tension and find a third way through what I eventually learned. You know, we would divest the manufacturing, we would keep all of the R&D, which was really the crown jewel for the country, and, yeah. and eventually find great partners to do the manufacturing. That sounds so easy, it's not easy. I mean, you're like, conceptually, that's so simple. But the problem is, those processes had all been built together. So in other words, you know, like those of you that do any manufacturing, in manufacturing, they're fixing stuff that they didn't like in design. Well, when you have partners, you can't do it that way. So it was convincing a whole group of people. So anyways, that's the change message. Would you say, what did I learn? I learned a lot about yes. how to manage tension and find a third way through. That's my lesson. On the indoor part, I would just have to tell you, and I think you're seeing this with a lot of young companies now, 20 years, 30, it gets to um, know what makes you, you. And like there was a time, uh, you know, because all this new stuff was happening, people were like, well, buy this company, get that, go into this area, this area. And I can remember a phone call I had with uh, Arnie Sorensen ran Marriott. He, he, Arnie's passed now. He was a great, great leader. Yes. Um, and I was calling, it, was it might have even been against Facebook. I don't remember who we were bidding against, a marketing program. And um, if you can't tell, I'm a little bit competitive. And I was calling him, I'm like, hey, you know, let me tell you all the reasons you should do, you know, big partners do this. And he said to me, Jenny, why do you even care about this? He's like, I rely on you for all this mission critical work you should just be the best IBM you could be. Yeah. And I will always remember those words, be the best IBM you can be. And it would lead me to, not, not just a one conversation, but I'm like, you're right, these are ornaments. All this other stuff is ornaments on a tree. Like that isn't the core of what I do. I do mission critical work. I would divest of these businesses and I would, it would lead to $10 billion of divestitures, not just a one call, but I mean that kind of concept. And um, so that idea of what should endure but modernize, you know, so I knew what I was then and that would lead to hybrid cloud. Okay, that's a, the principle and I'll give you two others and stop. Very fast. The other thing I learned the most though is, it wasn't just what you do. Both of those comments were lessons on what to do. How work gets done is as important as what the work is. So that would be like super, 
that would take me down design thinking at scale of hundreds of thousands of people, agile at hundreds of thousands. Today, that's common. It wasn't in 2012. Um, and then skills. Two out of 10 people had skills for the future. We would end when I retired at eight out of 10. So a whole, that back to all that skill thing, which would take me down that path about, this is all about getting people to want to continue to change their skills. Don't hire for a skill. I always got in trouble when I hired people for an expert skill, because usually that's all they wanted to do. Yeah. And, and the industry changed too fast. So um, that kind of gets, like I end the book on a thought, which is, like, you'll do great things, but maybe what you do will matter a lot, but I do believe how you do it will matter just as much. And that's the how is, is worth thinking about. So thank you for giving us in this setting a little bit of a sense of the how that you approached this as well. Uh, Jenny, one of the things that we talked about about this session, um, not every um, CEO um, who is a woman likes to touch on um, that dimension of yeah. being a leader. Um, we agreed that um, you might be willing to say a few words Just along so nice. those lines. so nice, yeah, yeah. Hey, well, I have to say, I, it's a tap, how many of, of, my, of my women in the room, how many of you like to talk about being, okay, first raise your hand if you're a woman. Okay, I, that's a bad question in this day and age, okay? <laughs> Anyone who identifies as a woman and then that, that likes to talk about it. Okay, there's only a, okay, well at least thank you. There's a few of you. And I, when I, even, you know, just as a young person, I was all, often the only woman in my classes. This is the 70s, right? And then into the 80s. Um, and I knew when I spoke, if I said something stupid, everybody remembered, because I was just by virtue of being the only woman there. And so it was good and bad. It wasn't really fair. On the other hand, it made me study a lot. That, that is what did it, because I was like, OK, I got to be prepared so I don't say something stupid. And it, it, th th this horrible habit has stayed with me forever, uh, by the way. And so um, therefore, though, I never wanted to talk about it. I would always say, hey, just look at me for my stuff, my work. You know, Please don't want to talk about it. And uh, two things would happen. I told David I would talk about it. One would be mm, a third into my career or so, I was giving a speech on financial services. That was my industry expertise. And I thought it was a very riveting speech, you guys. And I was in Australia, and a man at the end comes up to me, and he says, um, I think he's going to ask me something about my speech, so great it was. And he says, I wish my daughter had been here. And it's one of those like watershed moments you always remember. And I kind of back to the power of we, not me. I was sort of like, OK, this isn't really about me. This is about other people. And when you get to a certain level of responsibility, it is not about you. And that my pushing away this topic always, people cannot be what they cannot see, that saying you've heard. And therefore, I needed to be a bit, I needed to embrace this being a role model, because it wasn't really for me. It was for everybody else. So, that would be a turning point. And then the other turning point would be my husband, who um, I have been married 43 years. Isn't it like my most popular uh, LinkedIn post? OK, this is crazy to me, all right? Like I get, well, maybe not most, I, it, I, it, but close. I find this, I post something. These guys talked me into posting on my wedding anniversary. I've been married 43 years. And um, it's a picture of my wedding and my husband today. I look the same, he does not. And um, <laughs> so, OK, maybe this is why I'm about what I can tell you I find so funny. And then I'm going to come back to what I learned. Uh, so it's got like a half, a half a million impressions. I'm like, who cares about this? But apparently, there's a half a million on, because I talk about my husband in this. So uh, 43 years, but back in early years, uh, I'd been offered a job, a pretty big job. Man, I was working for, like, let's say I was working for David. And David said, Jenny, I'm getting in, he's getting promoted, and I want you to take my job. And my answer was, David, I said, I'm not ready for your job. I said, two more years, and I would know the rest of the business. Give me two more years. And he said, I think you should go to the interview. So I go to the interview. Person offers me the job. And what do you think my answer was? Anyone? David, what do you think my answer was? I'm hoping it's yes. <laughs> no. I said, I want to go home and talk to my husband. And he said to me, OK. I go home. I, I don't remember if it was home or phone, OK, because I traveled always. And I said, uh, I told my husband the story. Yeah. He says, Jenny, do you think a man would answer it that way? Hmm. I said, no. 
he said, I know you, you know, like, you'll know, you'll be comfortable in six months and ready to do something else. Like, this is ridiculous. Why do you always doubt? You're always, you're always talking about what you don't know. And, and I don't know that this is true just for, I, I have found it to be very true for women, and many men too, but, and it would lead me to this, uh, like, it's probably, the, it's probably what the title of the book should have been. Growth and comfort never coexist, yeah. never. And to really internalize that, and if you do, it would have a remarkable influence on me. But as a woman leader, yeah. and I would speak about this with my IBM people around the world, all 170 countries, we'd have this, and I found it true everywhere I went. And, but it would, if you understood that, and really, you know, it would get me like willing, I was willing to then take more risk, then more risk, then more risk. And then I even got to the point where I was like, I was looking for trouble because I was like, hey, if I'm not comfortable, I am learning something. So I was just helping someone else who's in a really thick problem. And, I, and the person was really lamenting. And I said, hey, I, I want you to think about a year from now. I'm telling you how much you're gonna know. You are gonna feel so much better at the other end of this. And so, that, as a being a woman leader, that was like part of my biggest advice I would give, it, it, or to anyone. I would find it true for a company, for a country, it doesn't matter. Growth and comfort never coexist. Uh, thank you for that answer. Thank you for being was an honest to, answer. That was that. to take the question. It, it also helps us do a little bit of double duty, because I want to ask you about the book. And um, Oh, I've only been I, talking about it the whole time, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so, and we're going to need, I think, to open up to questions from... Mm the known and unknown universe yeah, uh, before okay. too long. And so, uh, but are there, um, when you think about the book, um, it is a really great book, and um, I advise you not only to have You don't have to buy it, they're gonna give you one, so. Yeah. You know. <laughs> uh, but uh, give, it a, give it a read. Um, uh, are there other lessons that you'd wanna call out before we uh, open it up a little bit further? No, look, I, why did I even write a book? It was never anything I wanted to, never on my hit parade to do, ever. I would joke, oh, it'd be a pamphlet. I would make jokes about it. And um, after I retired, people would say, hey, but you've had such an interesting journey. And it gets back to this role model quite, you know, mm -hmm. this journey has been so interesting and you've had so many lessons. And then I had to think about, and this is the part that made the book super hard for me to write. I really wanted to write about that education topic, skills first, like a whole book on that. And people are like, nah. They're like, but what people really want to know is, like, what did you learn? People learn from your mistakes, your feelings. That's really hard to put your life and be authentic in a book. Um, I mean, I was, I was used to being graded every day as a CEO, right? And, 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 I, and I speak about that because I had huge critics of what I had, but I knew what I had to do. I, I knew I had to give the company a foundation for its next era, and that was going to be brutal. And... And I did, and they've grown, and they've done well, and my success, I mean, these are, this is all I could hope for. But I, I knew so much of what I did would benefit the future, not the present. Um, so I talk about that. And so my only point of, so I, when I ended up to write a book, I hope it is in service of you, because there's no other reason to do this. And that it, I hope, what I'd like you to know is that I hope it's full of like kind of practical tools to deal with all these issues of a non-perfect world but to inspire you that you could do really tough things. Because the, the kind of punchline is how to do really hard things, but do them in a positive way. A positive way that does embraces tension, runs to conflict, doesn't polarize things, does not use fear. I believe there's a good way to lead. And, and I think there's plenty of bad examples out there today. So that's in the end of the day. What you would take away is I hope, it teach, I hope there's practical tools for how you do hard stuff in a positive way. Um, and incredibly well prepared to do it, which is also part of your history. Well, that was just my your, life. Your, that just happened to be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> can I t um, thank you? At, um, so w are we going to open it up soon? Okay. okay. But can I just say, take tw 12 Please. seconds to say one thing? Say anything um, you'd like. Um, 
The first time you appeared in a course that Susan Hockfield and I lead um, at the Sloan School, um, I don't think you knew quite what to expect. You knew that there'd be plenty of questions, like I trust there will be. And it was on Zoom, as I recall, and you appeared on Zoom and you said, I hope I'm ready. And you had a stack of paper, I'm not making it up. The stack of papers was this high and you said, I, I, I've been doing my homework and I'm ready yeah, for this Yeah, this is a sickness, yeah. And, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I could tell you that no other CEO has come to that course with um, that. That's embarrassing. That was amazing. Yeah, I mean, always doing homework, right? You're yeah. doing your homework, exactly. Yeah. Um, so how shall we manage questions? Um, oh, and there we have them. Anything. Okay. Technology, by the way, we didn't talk a lot. You can name it. Hi, Jenny. Um, thank you for this, and thank you, Dean. Um, you know, I was just listening. I haven't read your book, I must admit, but I have listened to your interviews previously, and I knew that I needed to just be here for today. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, your childhood a little bit more, and specifically, you know, kind of the beliefs that you create, like you were imbibed in, you, in your younger years. And I wanted to learn a bit more about how it applied to this context of IBM. Uh, in the, in specifically, you said, you know, benefit the future, not the present, and it was brutal. And there would be people who would be after you, that, you know, there'd be, there'd be a target on your back. I, I'd love to learn a little bit more about that, if I may. Thank you. Yeah, you know, the biggest thing, and so do some of you know who Brene Brown is? Kind of a, you know, I, I had a brief conversation with her about, um, can you lead and do hard stuff if you haven't lived through tragedy yourself? And so, and we were kind of even talking about it particularly in light of young people today, really young, way younger than you guys, meaning in that, you know, if they've been kind of sheltered and coddled and not really had a tough situation, can they? And, and I guess her conclusion to me in that conversation was, we don't have to have tragedy, but you've had to have gone through some adversity. And the only reason I give you what did I learned about and what did it helped me do for IBM was what I saw with what happened with my family, that defined the bar for bad for me. And nothing else looked bad compared to that. All this other stuff, as bad as it could be, was never as bad as that. And so that gives you a bit of a freedom to like this feeling of there's no bad ending. You do everything you know how to do and you could do really hard things because that's bad. What you're in now is not bad. And so that's one thing I think my childhood taught me. I think the other was this issue. You guys are here, you're big learners. I am just a big learner about knowledge. You know, at first it was a shield to me. It would later be the confidence. It would then later allow me to do more and more. So I'm still a, like a really big believer in a propensity to learn. A huge, you know, this constant, constant desire. It taught me that. But it also taught me, I'll leave you with the third thing. Um, it was, oh, one more appendage to the learning part. I know, I gotta get my answer shorter, was, uh, the book is short, by the way, um, is this idea of always apprenticing. Like, I ended up doing 50 different, I mean, I was always learning something else, in that in our lives, I think, this is so overlooked, the value of apprenticing on things. Okay, but the third big thing I would say that my childhood taught me was, um, it's this value of community in the small things that you do. And like, I, would, I should have never been at Northwestern. I mean, I, and I could have never afforded it. I mean, what my neighbors did, like we had this house, we couldn't afford grass, anything. It looked horrible. The next door people had nice houses. And you know, instead of being mean to us, the guy would say, well, here, use my lawnmower to mow your weeds, you know? I mean, he would hire my sister to babysit when they didn't need a babysitter. They would, it was all these little things people did that helped. Uh, fed my other sister breakfast when we couldn't afford, you know. It was a million things that I don't think you realize matter. It, very personal. And that would influence my leadership style tremendously about appealing to people's hearts and minds at the same time and that it takes a community to do things. And like I, North, General Motors paid for two years at Northwestern for me. And, and Northwestern is an extremely expensive school like you guys. And, um, and so, That's true. you know, and I learned a bit about loyalty. Like I didn't, in those days, they gave me a scholarship with no strings attached. 
and paid all my tuition, all my everything. And I, um, I felt a great loyalty to them. And so I went to work there, but I learned at an early age then the difference between a job and a career. You have to have passion about what you do, some part of that day. And I wasn't passionate. My good friend is Mary Barra now, who loves cars. Um, so I just didn't love them like she does. And so that taught me a lot, right, about that. So those are the kinds of things that I talk about in those early years that, and just just showing up in those early years and being and doing what you say are all those little things that I kind of write about in the beginning. I don't know, does that help your answer at all? Or just, Thank you so much. okay. Thank you so much for your time today. Oh, I guess this, oh, it works. Uh, my name is Emily Warren. I'm a sophomore undergraduate majoring in finance, minoring in computer science and Chinese. And I recently watched this TED talk that's titled Stop Managing and Start Leading. And I was just curious to hear your thoughts on kind of how we should be leading efficiently or what you think makes an exceptional CEO. Thank you. Well, CEO, hmm. That's, uh, look, what was one word I could leave you with in today's world? You could vote on it yourselves. I think the best leaders are the most authentic leaders today. So. That's the one word I would lead you with, was authentic. And, and Emily, that's, and I think that feels better to a lot of people today than it used to, but you know, kind of in my day it wasn't. And um, I think people want to follow leaders, you know? They, and so that idea that followership, you know, followership doesn't happen by an org chart. I learned that watching someone who, I thought, because IBM was a big company, half a million people, that I thought, God, he gets everybody to do what he wants. And like a fraction of these people actually work for him. People follow passion, authenticity, a, a knowledge of what they're doing. People follow that. And so I think that idea of authentic and followership are very much related in today's world of leadership. It takes courage. Yeah, but courage comes from conviction, don't you think? Yes. What do you think is the root of courage? Um, Confidence often, um, and what builds confidence, and so. Yeah, yeah. You're, well, you're right, because confidence can also come from facts and mm -hmm. other things, right? Yeah. And sometimes confidence can come from nothing, too, right? So um, <laughs> I know a lot of people like that. Not me, but others, yeah. <laughs> yeah can, can I do so, uh, so? Yeah, please. There was a CEO in a class uh, that I was leading this past year, and someone asked about imposter syndrome and how you think about that as a leader and how you help people you know, who may be experiencing imposter syst uh, syndrome. And the person said, well, um, I, I always try to help someone work. Wait, were you thinking that I felt imposter syndrome? I've never <laughs> felt that once in my life. Yeah. So does, some people just any, have confidence, yeah, don't this they? This is interesting. Found it or not. Does, does, uh, how many people think of imposter syndrome? Yeah, a lot. Oh, that's so so interesting to me. For yourselves or someone, your brother, or uh, is it for uh, <laughs> that right. kind of thing? I got asked that question a lot writing the book to really? write about imposter syndrome. There's a lot of things that ended up going back in the book after, like okay, like you'd expect me. I had my co-writer. She's like, I've never had a writer have so many people pre-read their book and you know, get all their critiques. And she's like, you handled those so well. And I'm like, well, I would certainly rather fix the problems now versus ask for it's published, you know? And so, and so we ended up adding a lot of things that people, and this imposter syndrome is one that came up a lot. And um, I have to say, but I have a, I too, mm -hmm. I just didn't call it that. I've already told you how I, I didn't feel confident. So that's clearly imposter syndrome, right? Um, yeah. But I, you guys, a lot of your hands went up, and I found there are tons of people feel that way. And my way around it was always that extra preparation, right? And, and then you'd find you're more prepared than anyone else in the room, so like, why do you feel like an imposter? So that would be my way around it, right? Yeah. It, it's a controversial topic, actually. It, it is, it's yeah, it's know. so interesting. Right. Okay, sorry. Um, hi, my name is Joyce. I'm a second year MBA student. Um, my question to you is, I'm curious what drives you. I think a lot of CEOs come in and, you know, from personal tragedy, from personal motivations, they climb up the ranks, they have this passion, they're like, I want to be the best, I want to do all these things. And what I'm struck by in your conversation is that you care deeply about people, about empowering others. Um, 
and I'm curious how that adds or is in conflict with your progression to the CEO because most people that I find that care deeply about people don't necessarily want to be the figurehead yeah, and the CEO. That's an interesting question, I think. And, um, and I'm not sure there's a, you know, Joyce, that there's a right or a wrong on this topic, actually. Because um, there's brilliant people that maybe don't, you know, don't care for people too much, right? Um, I always felt, back to that authentic point, and if you wanted to accomplish big things, you know those old sayings, you can't do them alone and all that kind of thing? I guess because I was always grown on scale, right? I, like, in big things, it became clear to me that you couldn't do it yourself very early. And even my childhood taught me that. Like, I could do very little by myself. It was this community, family that got us through. So that's in my head, and then I'm in a place that's very large, and you realize to get big stuff done in the world, you got to bring people along, which is, to me, the point of good power. Like, and the third whole piece is about how to drive societal change. Like, don't give up. Like, I see a lot of people feel like, oh, the system is useless, or you can't change government, you can't change these things. And I have a lot of examples. That's not true. It doesn't happen like a big bang. But it does, it's like a pebble in the water and it just moves out. And you stay with it. And there's ways to do it to get lots of people to do things as long as you don't force them to do it your way. And I think that was a big learning and that all gets back to why the focus on people. And, and that's why like these principles in the beginning of this middle section, I do try to make it a bit educational and try to like a timeless lesson that you could apply to any problem. Start with be in service of something. Do not serve it. Because if you're in service of something, the big difference is I care David succeeds in his goal, and as a result, I will make mine asynchronously. And there's a bit of trust in there because I got to assume. It's like if you go to dinner and the waiter, I write about, you know, the waiter brings you your food. Does that mean you had a good night? Mm, not always. If he really cares about the evening, how you know you can tell the difference, right? And he's he's doing that because he hopes he gets a big tip, or she may not. But it's like a, a boat, a, a leap of faith. I have found that true with business. To be in service of something will bring more people with you. Then this idea about um, building belief for people is like a tiring, never-ending job. And my learning on it, and we were talking about Ken Chenault a minute ago. Again, these are dear friends now, but Ken. Um, Ken used to say to me, the role of a leader is to paint reality and give hope. Because it's not rah-rah stuff. Build belief is not, hey, let's go do this. Let's tell me, let me tell you all the reasons. And um, I Google it one day, and it's actually Napoleon who said it, OK? So I told Ken he's got to reframe his articles on this. And um, so, but it would become such a big part of bringing people along to be honest when things are bad and about it, and then, but, but always a way forward. That would be what I would also learn from my childhood. Always a way forward. I don't care what anyone says, always a way forward. And um, when you're changing things like society, you gotta believe in that. And that you can bake a big complex problem into little pieces like you learn in engineering and you just keep working on all of them and they're all related. So I don't think it's about whether you believe in people and wanna lead, it's like if you wanna do big stuff, you have to believe in it, is kind of how I feel on that topic. I also liked it. So I mean, that would, it was more it, it, me, right? So, but I don't know how you do big, important stuff without bringing a lot of people with you these days. Can I do enough? You've been what? listening to right someone here? who's brought a lot of people with her. Um, yeah. I think, well, are we supposed to bring this to closure? Or I one more? One last question. For okay. You. We have Sorry. permission for one more. Okay. Is this your question? <laughs> it's from Zoom. Oh, okay. Um, so one of internet. our friends. Is my, is my husband on or something? <laughs> <laughs> how can no, he's on a help. golf course. How can leaders develop resilience in today's world? Mm -hmm. And how do you instill that mm -hmm. as a value with your team? Okay. I didn't realize the time. So here's two, word, two things on resilience. I beg you to, because I think this is. We didn't get to talk about good tech, all right? Because I feel strongly you're all stewards of technology, by the way. And that, that means you manage the upside and the downside of tech in parallel, which is not what I think is happening right now. OK, another lecture. You, but you the um, resilience, two tips 
I put a whole section in there on resilience for a reason. You mentioned I've had I had some of the roughest of times, right? And I write about it. I'm not, you know, I'm very clear about it. And uh, what got me through that was relationships and my attitude. And my own attitude tips to you would be I compartmentalize bad things. I don't, mean, I don't deny them. I deal with them, plan, box, goes on the shelf, go on to the next issue. Circle back, open up the box, see if it made progress, back out. But you can't let it bleed into everything you do. And so I talk about things like embracing critics, but don't let them define you. I will always listen to a critic. I will. It's horrible. But occasionally, there's an ounce of truth in there, OK? Um, let's, so part of it's your own attitude and conviction. You talked about, right, conviction, right? Like my, my little nephew would say to me, he was 10, he'd say, Auntie, doesn't that upset you when they say mean things about IBM on television? And I told him no. I to and I told my mom, turn the TV off. I said, I'll tell you when you can turn it back on. I said, I'm doing what I know I have to do. And that's the conviction, right? Um, relationship, my tip to you on relationship would be, relationships come from what you give, not what you get. And if you truly live a life that way, they will always come back in the moments you need them. And they will be your greatest source of perspective. So when you are doing really hard things, I can't tell you how many times people would, no, 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 you're looking at that the wrong way. You're down, no, 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 this should, you should, no, don't care about that, that is not important. You know, it would always be those relationships. And the one with yourself would be the most important. And I'll end on that. That's a great Because um, I write a lot about that. that uh, People would ask me a lot about work-life balance, and you already talked about my, my pro proclivities to all this stuff. And there would be a time I would get really unhealthy. I probably weighed 75, 80 pounds more than I weigh now. And I was just consumed by my work. And people say, well, whose fault is that? And uh, I really realized the only person that could create boundaries and give balance was me. That was it. I, that IBM, my bosses, they would take everything I could give. And I really can't anger for that. that is, it's like inanimate. It's, that's what thing, institutions do. And so that was my job to say boundary. And I started to set some boundaries, you know, like I would ride a bicycle on a Saturday morning. I'd like read emails, okay, like these old days, you know, while I was there. That was my ability to start. And then it would get better. But I learned that if I set those boundaries and was clear with people, like I didn't make it up and lie, people would start to move around those boundaries mm -hmm. and respect them. And it would give them permission to do the same thing. So, that resilience is for you to set some boundaries because if you don't have other things, people, relationships, yeah. friends, I, it wasn't quality of time I could spend with them. It was the quantity. I mean, not the quali quantity, it was the quality. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> quality of what I could do. I would learn to turn the phone upside down. I would learn to listen, be present in the moment. I learned that from my husband, right? You know, he'd be like, well, you've been in the bathroom 15 minutes. What could you possibly have been doing in there other than your phone, right? Yep, that's probably true. I would learn that wasn't it. I had to be present. In, but if I could be present in those moments, in that quality, it would be such a source of resilience for me. So that's what I would hope for you, too. Thank you for these gifts to MIT. Well, to all of these people. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thank Pleasure. You. Thank mm -hmm. you.